At last, at last, a voice for the people who pay big government bills, not the people who make big government bills. You are listening to Speaking of Taxpayers, sponsored by the 362,000 member National Taxpayers Union. I'm your co-host, Pete Sepp. And I'm your co-host, Doug Kellogg. Welcome to this week's broadcast. Well, this week we're very happy to have one of our friends from the Taxpayers Protection Alliance in the studio to talk about some of the big issues facing taxpayers this week. Of course, the big spending bill in that we call the Omnibus, and uh, the Taxpayer Advocate released their 2013 report with a bunch of really in-depth and interesting recommendations uh, on the IRS side of things. So let's welcome Mitchie Iliazzi to the program from TPA. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Doug, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, absolutely. Let's get down to a few numbers with this. Well, let's just call it what it is, the ominous spending bill because there are some ominous policies for taxpayers loaded into this thing. First, we've got, of course, the top line number, 1.012 trillion with a T dollars, 1,582 pages. So uh, do you recall um, how long was it between the introduction and passage of this thing? Well, let's see. They introduced it Monday night, I believe, uh, yes. is when it dropped. And then they passed it yesterday was Thursday was final passage in the Senate. And they were able to pass it, I believe, before 630. Yeah. So that's less than four days. And the House shot that sucker through their chamber on Wednesday. Wednesday. So, hmm, wonder if anybody had time to actually read this thing. I doubt it sincerely, and it sure does show. Let's tick off a few things here. We have a one-year delay of all flood insurance rate increases for homes being remapped into flood zones. Well, this is a problem, folks, because back in a couple of years ago, there was something called the Biggert Waters Flood Insurance Reform Initiative. That was legislation passed that was designed to try and clean up the horrendously debt-riddled National Flood Insurance Program, now $25 billion in the hole. And guess who covers that? You and I do. And so, once again, just like they did with the budget caps of 2011, Mishy, they're saying, well, we don't need to worry about these reforms just right now. Let's put them off a little while. Yeah, this is, this is you know, each, each agreement that we are seeing that's bipartisan, that's been coming out, the news is getting worse. Um, it's yeah. not getting better. And these delays, they're delaying it now for a year. What's to say next year that they're not going to try and delay it again? Yes. And that, that, that's the problem. It, it's, it's very much like the sequester. We've got the spending cuts. They actually went into effect for the first time, but now we're delaying them. And now with the flood insurance reform, the reform was passed. We got the reform, but now when it's supposed to be implemented, no, we're going to go ahead and delay them. No rush on that. So we're seeing that just getting the reforms now, which is a battle in and of itself, it's not enough yeah. because the reforms aren't being implemented. Yeah, always with the delays. And, of course, we also have programs that are in need of reform but nonetheless got funded. $612 million additional, uh, $8.6 billion total for Head Start. Now, this is a program that has a great public image. It's designed to give young disadvantaged children a Head Start in life by providing them with extra care and education. Trouble is, studies have begun to show, and these are commissioned by the Department of Health and Human Services, that while there might be an initial impact in helping a child to learn more, it dissipates as they go further into the elementary grade school level. And yet Congress is not listening to those studies. They're appropriating more and more money. Also, provisions prohibiting the U.S. Postal Service from making any kinds of reforms like ending Saturday delivery or closing some rural post offices. The problem there? Well, no, the 
Postal Service is not taxpayer funded right now, but just like other things like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, these practices, if allowed to continue, and if Congress keeps standing in the way of reform, we may be stuck with a broke postal service, and by broke I mean bankrupt, to the point where we the taxpayers are going to have to bail it out again. Yeah, I think the Head Start uh, money that was put in was really important because it was sequestration cuts. Yes. And so they went in and retroactively said, no, you know what, we're going to go ahead and we're going to give you some relief on that. And so that's, again, it's a real problem that you're right, these programs do need to be reformed. And instead of reforming them by figuring out a way to spend less money to make them work better, we're going to spend more money to perpetuate the way it hasn't been working to begin with. Yeah, yeah. And this is especially acute, I think, in the area of national security and defense, which is your specialty, sir, as evidenced in a recent piece you wrote. Tell us a little bit about this. Sure. Uh, the, we released a um, list yesterday of just the defense appropriations earmarks. Now, obviously, there are loads of appropriations in the omnibus, $1.1 trillion spending bill, and you've got health, education, agriculture, and but, but we looked at defense specifically, and we found $7 billion worth of money that wasn't requested mm. by the Pentagon, but was put in into the omnibus. And Ouch. Yeah, 186 items. And there Whoa. are obviously uh, things in there that you can find that are flaws that we don't need. They're either for programs that aren't working, programs that the Pentagon doesn't want, programs the Pentagon says doesn't work and we don't need, and yet the money was appropriated. Mm -hmm. So TPA went down, we put the list out there for everyone to see, we were able to get the list out before the Senate voted, and, and, and this, the problem is, is this is just one aspect of it. Obviously defense is a major part of the bill, um, and there was, a, there was an article that did discuss before the omnibus came out, how research and development was going to be big for the Defense Department. Sure. And that's where a lot of this was found. We go through and we list and you can see a lot of the major remarks are for R&D. And, and this, is, this is a systemic problem, obviously. Um, $7 billion is not a number to sneeze about. And when you go down the list and you look at some of the things that are on there, there's one earmark that is $950 million alone. Yikes. Just one. Yeah. Um, so it's it, it's pretty dis disheartening for taxpayers, um, especially when we're dealing with a debt like we have and we see a bill that takes less than four days to go through both houses and it's loaded with money that wasn't requested, that they probably do not need. And then we get into a situation like we had this last year before the government shut down with spend it or lose it. Now yes. that they've been appropriated this money, yeah. It's going to be spent. We yeah. can't go back now because if they don't spend it, they'll lose it. And the last thing that they're going to do is say, well, we don't want to lose our money because that's exactly what happened this past <laughs> fall. And it was, yeah. it was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty disheartening for the taxpayers. Yeah, absolutely. Can you give us just a couple of examples of what you uncovered? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did save the $950 million. Yes. So I'll go ahead and list that. That was at the top of our list. It is for the Virginia class submarine, oh, and it's to goodness. fully fund the program, and that's under shipbuilding and, and uh, conversion in the Navy. Another one was two hundred and eighteen million for private sector care, and it's just a program adjustment. So private huh. sector, but public <laughs> money. So All right. it, yeah, it's it's definitely that's something bizarre. that yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, you know, you you look down this list. And you find things. Th these are my, this is my favorite actually, one hundred and four million two hundred and seven thousand. And there are a couple of these, but they have the same qualification. Mm -hmm. It's a classified program yeah. and a classified adjustment. Yes. We can't tell you what it is. You're not going to know what it is. Nobody <laughs> asked for it, but we're putting it in there, and that comes up a lot. And, and you know the list goes on and on. I mean, you've got things for the the. The Joint Strike Fighter. You've got yes. things for LCS. I mean, these are programs that that haven't been working and they've been trying to get rid of, but yet we're putting more money into them. And with 186 different items, I'm sure that everyone can find something that they can look at and say, 
we don't need that. We shouldn't be spending money on it. And the least amount of money that they're spending is $1 million. And you think, oh, that's not that bad. Well, it actually is bad because yes. they shouldn't be spending any money that they don't need. So if the least amount of waste that the government is spending is a million dollars, that's a really bad bar that we're setting already with a problem that we really need to solve. Yeah, yeah. And I think my math may be, well, it's always rusty, but it may be right here that weren't the uh, complaints about this bill being issued about the fact that we were going to plus up the so-called overseas contingency operations account by some five billion dollars. I know there's a dispute over whether it was even more than that, but five billion's the reported figure, and yet you've uncovered seven billion dollars worth of earmarks. Hmm. If Congress had decided not to do this, the plus up might not have been necessary. It's actually funny that you bring that up because some of the money that wasn't requested actually came in the overseas contingency operation portion. So almost now we're doubling up <laughs> on money that we said we didn't need anyway. So when you look at it, not only were they requesting more for the overseas contingency operation portion, but they were also requesting more that they didn't request in the first place. <laughs> yeah, if you can figure that out. And, and it's really uh, funny because this is the first time, I'm sure, as you know, that war spending has gone up yeah. since 2010. Yes. And so while we have representatives running around trotting the number saying, oh, but we're spending less, no, they're spending more. And, and, and if growth in spending and defense is happening for the first time in several years, that really doesn't bode well down the pike for other, th other sectors that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just one final thing we ought to discuss here, the definition of an earmark. There is technically a ban on this practice that uh, members of Congress have been following for a number of years, but really to anyone outside the Beltway looking in, these have the de facto effect of earmarks, do they not? Ab absolutely. You know, this is something that is really important for everyone to understand, that though the practice is banned, there are obviously ways that, that we are getting around it. And there is definitely money that may have been requ not requested but had to be put in um, for things like the Navy Yard. They had an incident there. So if there was money that they hadn't requested before that incident, yeah. that's not an earmark. That's certainly money that's going to be used. But when you're asking for an extra helicopter to be built that the Pentagon hasn't asked for, that is an earmark. That is yes. money that taxpayers shouldn't be paying for because nobody who's responsible for setting up who's going to build it and using the finished product is saying we need this. But yet Congress is going in on their own and putting in extra money that the agency didn't ask for and that they will have to use, as we did talk about. So you, though, you, though it's right to say that um, technically – it's not an earmark because it doesn't fit the definition of Washington speak. An earmark, it really is de facto for taxpayers because they're the ones who have to pay for it, and it's money that nobody requested. Well, shifting now from the spending side of the ledger to the tax side of the ledger, we had just this week the release of the National Taxpayer Advocates Report to Congress, an annual thing brought to you actually thanks in large part to the advocacy of your National Taxpayers Union. We trumped the, up the first Taxpayers' Bill of Rights in 1988 with a coalition involving everybody from the American Civil Liberties Union to the National Council of La Raza. We helped to pass the second Taxpayers' Bill of Rights in 1996. That created the IRS Taxpayer Advocate as well as gave it new powers, the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998, which uh, also happened to give the Taxpayer Advocate this reporting duty, and it's been very helpful in identifying some of the biggest problems facing taxpayers. Not always the best recommendations because they often involve increasing the IRS's budget, but what you going to do? You take what you can get from these reports, and there's a lot to get from this one. What do we have, Doug? Well, I'm sure taxpayers will not be surprised that a report about the problems with the IRS is so huge. Um, but I definitely recommend that listeners check it out. If you have the time, taxpayeradvocate.irs.gov. It is pretty readable if you go through the sections, if you're curious about exactly 
all of the details about what's going on with the IRS and uh, some of the challenges they're facing and uh, some of the reasons your service there might not be as uh, desirable as you'd like. Um, but as Pete noted, this has been an ongoing process and there are a number of things that return here. And uh, one of the first uh, items on the docket that is of big interest to taxpayers is a taxpayer bill of rights and the advocate recommending, I think not for the first time, that the IRS uh, more clearly identify taxpayer rights in a sort of bill of rights style document. Yes, what we need here is a broad articulation of principles of the things that taxpayers ought to be able to expect from their agency whenever they're interacting with it. Now, there have been things like IRS Publication 1, your rights as a taxpayer. There are things in statutes of various kinds that talk about how important it is for taxpayers to have protections during the appeals process, the audit process. We've been adding those since 1988, and we're proud to have done that. But this would be a helpful step, I think, in reestablishing what that 1998 IRS Restructuring and Reform Act tried to do, which was to balance the two guiding principles of this agency between law enforcement and customer service. Obviously, there has to be some law enforcement to get the tax cheats, but by and large, if we're going to have voluntary compliance with this system, we need one that is customer service oriented and gives people the confidence that the tax system is being reasonably and fairly administered. And related to this, the report also recommends additional training for IRS agents on what taxpayers' rights actually are. Apparently, they don't get much training on that. But then it goes into increasing funding for training on that and a number of uh, fronts for IRS agents and, uh, and just a generally increasing the funding for the agency so that they can tackle a lot of these problems that are being identified. And I'm curious if you think if that is a real concern and a real solution or if the IRS should be able to manage within their current budget. Oh, I think they can manage with what they have. Now, part of the problem, and, and I think there is a very real concern here, that the IRS is being given responsibilities outside of tax collection that are going to be very difficult to implement. We interviewed Dan Pila last year about some of the challenges with the 2010 Health Care Act and how the IRS is going to have to do things like monitor a whole new source of income. Right now, the tax system is based on adjusted gross income, a solid concept with various definitions of what is and what isn't taxable, what is and cannot be included on your tax return. Well, now there's this concept called household income, which is for the purposes of qualifying for the exchanges, getting subsidies, et cetera. It's different from AGI. And this is not a light matter. The agency has to retool its computers, retrain its employees, basically construct a whole new compliance regime based on the new law. That's very difficult for any agency to do. I think they're going to have some serious bumps in the road over that still, even now as they're implementing parts of the law. And there are a lot of other recommendations in here that we can't get to without going well over time, but uh, some of them include um, prepare regulation, which is another issue that might be touchy for taxpayers. Yes. And, um, identity theft measures, which uh, hopefully will be something that can be done. I mean, there's a number of issues there, one of which uh, being that if taxpayers are falling victim to identity theft or malfeasance with their tax preparer, somebody sort of uh, predatorily uh, misfiling tax returns, getting their uh, refund taken away from them, that taxpayers should have some kind of uh, recourse with the IRS, and apparently that's not taking place currently. Uh, then also erroneously revoking tax-exempt status for organizations, which is not directly to tied to the recent scandal, uh, but certainly is something that organizations like NTU and TPA might be wary of. Yeah, and I think from a standpoint of TPA, every, everything you've talked about here is, is is very is very relevant. But it's it's more of the same. I mean, the report is good in that it recognizes the problems that the agency is facing, especially over the year that they've had. They've had a pretty rough year, I would say, uh, publicly. But the problem is, is that some of the the uh, solutions that they say that 
recommend are really not solutions that in, in a real world concept from what's wrong with the agency would reform those problems. Giving more money to the IRS really isn't the problem. The problem is, is that the money that they have now, how are they using it? So it's a little bit of a mixed bag uh, from TPA's standpoint, but yeah. it's, it's nice to see that self-assessment by the agency and recognizing that some problems do exist. But now the real question is, how do we get to solutions to find a way to fix those problems? Yeah. Well, a couple other things worth noting, uh, still short on time, so we'll go quickly, but digital currency rules were in the report this year, which is definitely interesting as we see the rise of Bitcoin. That could be an issue you'll see at organizations like NTU and TPA dealing with short, uh, shortly. And of course, FATCA, uh, which is nice to see as we've talked about FATCA on the podcast and written about it, uh, the ridiculously burdensome uh, rules of disclosure that are affecting tax American taxpayers internationally and causing them to be incapable of opening bank accounts and all sorts of unfortunate uh, side effects and uh, the uh, taxpayer advocate recommending that those rules are re-examined and hopefully done away with. Uh, but definitely international taxpayers, in addition to FATCA, are getting some attention here as well. So very classic problems, as uh, Michi and Pete have said. We're dealing with uh, repeat issues here with the IRS, and uh, hopefully the taxpayer advocate's recommendations will be taken into account. But as Pete can attest, I'm sure we've seen many good recommendations, yes. specifically repealing the AMT, which is in there again, not really come to fruition. All too often. And thank you, Michi, for joining us today and lending us some very enlightened commentary. Where can folks visit your website? Uh, they can go to www.protectingtaxpayers.org to see the full list of uh, earmarks and defense-wise in the omnibus and anything else uh, that we've got up there. But uh, thank you, Doug, and thank you, Pete, for all you do, and really appreciate you, appreciate you having uh, me on the show today. Absolutely. Well, we kicked off the show talking about a big spending bill related to the budget deal, and uh, that budget deal returns as we bring in Damian Brady of National Taxpayers Union Foundation to talk about how they've examined uh, Congress going back and revisiting some of the provisions in the budget deal in a way that will drive up costs even more. So welcome back to the podcast, Damian. So what did you guys find in this examination last week? Yeah, uh, we kicked off. Uh, our newsletter for the year by taking a look at all the bills in Congress that would try to undo or revisit some of the, the provisions that were included in the Budget Act that uh, closed out last year. Now, one item that was intentionally left out of the budget deal was extension of emergency unemployment compensation, and there's a number of efforts underway to try to extend that. Uh, the, the main proposal that they're working on would enact a three-month extension of emergency uh, unemployment benefits at a cost of around um, uh, 4 to $5 billion in the first year. And there's also a longer proposal. Senator Reid offered an amendment that would do an 11-month extension. Um, initial reports overestimated it in, in uh, the report that we had. Uh, based on media reports, but the CBO looked at it, and eleven well, one eleven month extension would uh, cost another seventeen billion dollars, and then a number of these proposals would would have um, provisions to pay for this new spending, but as we typically see, the spending would occur now, and the offsets would occur over a period of years through various spending reforms, and then Senator Reid's uh, idea for paying for seventeen new billion in spending now would be to an extend. The sequester for another year in 2024, which which was already done in the Budget Control Act, so this would add another savings that I'm sure we can bank on uh, 10, 11 years from now. It's something we seem to see seem to see a lot in Congress, not just paying for things in the future, but uh, looking towards the same offsets uh, that other bills and other packages are looking to, and just acting like everybody can reduce <laughs> reduce their uh, footprint by doing by cutting the same exact thing. Yeah, exactly. We, uh, in our newsletter, we listed all of the bills that we found that would extend the emergency unemployment. And then some of these bills had, had offsets, and so we listed those. And a number of those would uh, limit the amount of money that certain people can collect in agricultural direct uh, payment or subsidies. And you know, that's a reform that would occur over a number of years. And then it's also included in several of the farm bills that, that they're trying to negotiate through the House. And then similarly, one of the most controversial elements of the Budget Control Act was repeal of uh, a, a revision of the COLA for uh, certain veterans who are under right. the age of 62. 
So many of these people are able to work, have a job, and then they're collecting this, this, this pension so that the bill would change that. But it was controversial because it did include, it did not have a provision to exclude uh, disabled veterans from, from having their, their pensions taken away. And I don't think that was initially the intention of the people who drafted the bill. Um, so we saw a number of bills that were introduced to make sure that the disabled veterans uh, get, get their payment, uh, their, their benefits under the age of 62. But then also um, a number of members are pushing for a full repeal so that, that they can all collect this, the, the, the pension rates but before the Budget Control Act was passed. Or I'm sorry, the, the budget bipartisan budget deal was passed. That's something we'll definitely have to keep an eye on as they continue to revisit the bill. Is there anything else we should uh, know about NTUF uh, working on? Our newest tab, we take a look at uh, bills that would spend million dollars more for meteorology, uh, better weather forecasting for another $29 billion, million dollars per year, and other provisions that would, uh, other bills that would revisit savings passed a couple years ago. This is another thing we see often, uh, undoing savings that were just passed recently. And this includes subsidies for homeowners in floodplains buying federal insurance. Uh, well, the good news keeps on coming. But uh, in uh, just over a week, we'll have the State of the Union study as well. So definitely we'll be talking about that next week. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us. Thanks. It's time for the outrage of the week. We spent some time talking about outrageous spending and the taxpayer advocates report outrages at the IRS. And we're going to bring up some of the bigger highlights or lowlights from the taxpayer mm -hmm. advocates report right now in the outrage. And uh, this one is per perhaps the uh, most egregious specific problem that was noted in the report. The IRS declined to abate more than $40 million in penalties that were imposed, imposed improperly. Uh, against 46,000 taxpayers and is continuing to try to collect $20 million of those penalties. And the IRS, uh, excuse me, the taxpayer advocate says that the IRS's decision not to abate inapplicable penalties illustrates its resource driven approach to them, which is damning when it's translated to English. Which as, means money grubbing. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. They view these penalties as uh, money, moolah, cakes. Yes. <laughs> They're uh, bringing in the dough with them, and uh, so they're not going to stop collecting them, even when they're proven to be improperly assessed. Yeah, and that is outright disrespect for the principles outlined in things like the 98 Restructuring and Reform Act or the 88 Taxpayers' Bill of Rights. These are actions of an agency that is just they're guaranteed to put a dent in voluntary compliance with the law. People need to perceive that they're going to be treated fairly, that when they make a mistake, well, the IRS is going to say, here's a penalty, you've got to pay it. Well, when the IRS makes a mistake over the mistake, taxpayers are entitled to see the agency correct its error and say, we're not going to assess this penalty on you. And as we talked about before, uh, one of the recommendations that's a little controversial to taxpayer advocates is that some of these problems can be solved by more funding for an agency that already has thousands upon thousands of employees and money at their disposal. Uh, and yet, uh, as Pete has the side of the report that notes how they're failing <laughs> to respond to taxpayers in this year in a particularly record fashion and yes. not in a good way. Yes, the IRS failed to answer about 39% of the customer service calls that came into its centers, and it could only respond in a timely fashion to 47% of taxpayers' letters about proposed adjustments. That's a very important figure because there are deadlines built into the laws and administrative rules as to when a taxpayer has to respond to these notices and when the IRS has to respond. We're talking about people who are trying to comply with the law here contacting the IRS saying, well, I have a question about this part of the bill. I think I might have documentation to clear this up. Well, they send it to the IRS. The clock keeps ticking. What's going to happen if the agency doesn't respond, a deadline is missed, and a collection action is initiated against a taxpayer? The 
this is just dead wrong. I think what all these, what both these examples really illustrate, and what is so outrageous about this outrage, is that the agency is essentially incentivized into bad behavior. And that's one of the big reasons we're, and along with our friends at TPA who were in here earlier, are concerned about uh, the IRS getting more money and essentially more power. Uh, that There needs to be, again, more systematic and systemic uh, restructuring and, and fixes for these things. And hopefully things like uh, simplifying the tax code and uh, installing a taxpayer bill of rights uh, with the IRS will be more helpful first steps towards fixing that type of these types of problems than just throwing more money at the agency. A nearly 40% failure rate to respond to customer service calls. Hello, IRS, this is your conscience calling. Will you pick up? That's why this is the outrage of the week. That about does it for this edition of Speaking of Taxpayers. Remember, folks, you have the power to fight the power if you speak truth to power. And we speak truth to power every week here on Speaking of Taxpayers. I'm your co-host, Pete Sepp. And I'm your co-host, Doug Kellogg. So long.